thank Lord Dano for his uh, kind speech. Uh, we now go over to the proposition uh, to Dr. Chester Hyde. First of all, may I <coughs> join the previous speakers in thanking the President and the Union Society for the invitation, because it is a great honor and also pleasure to speak to you today. What I will do in my presentation today, in my brief talk, is to argue passionately against, or in fact, in favor of the proposition. And so let me start my uh, talk with a brief quote uh, by the American President Woodrow Wilson. In 1918, he said, self-determination self is not a mere phrase. It is an imperative principle of action which statesmen will henceforth ignore the power. Interestingly, however, his Secretary of State, Lansing, said, the phrase is simply loaded with dynamite. What a calamity that the phrase was ever uttered. What misery it will cause. And I think self-determination, the idea of self-determination, goes at the core of why the nation state can't function, or can't function anymore. My previous, the previous speaker on my side, James has made some very good general arguments about why the nation state is an obsolete concept. And so I would like to take on two problems. And the first one has to do with the fact that the nation state, as an idea, tends to fragment, tends to cause further fragmentation. <coughs> that it simply fragments society to kind of a, 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 an, an, elemental, an elemental level. Secondly, I think that the nation state as an idea <coughs> tends to create fertile soil for more radical ideologies. So even though some elements of nationalism may seem benign under the wrong circumstances, they become, may become nasty. And we're already seeing signs of this in the present political climate. But before we get into the discussion proper, I would like to, to clarify the concept of the nation state itself. On a, on a superficial level, it seems like the nation state is an entity, a political entity, uh, in which the population, the, the ethnic identity of the population and the state are congruous. But when we look at the concepts more closely, we actually find that they don't really match. And so far, as few states have ever sought or succeeded in becoming fully national uh, entities. That where this was attempted, the consequences were often catastrophic. And we can think here, let's think here, for example, of the Greek and Armenian genocide in Turkey in the First World War. Um, and also following on from this, the population exchange of 1923. Or after the Second World War, when <coughs> even the Germans were, ex when were, were expelled from Eastern Germany. In both cases, millions of people died. So, in other words, the point is that the nation state is a, is a misnomer because nations and states are rarely congruous. And this is even made more, more, more complicated by the fact by, of, of mass migration, voluntary mass migration, which has tended to dilute the identity of nations and has done so for a very long time. For example, we, we, may, we may think that we live in a particularly global age, but as a matter of fact, our ancestors were a lot more mobile than we were. Think of empire building in the 19th century, and actually just to take an example from my own country, from Germany, Germans were a lot more mobile, were twice as mobile in the first decade of the 20th century as they were during the economic miracle in the 1960s and 70s. So the question is, so where does this leave us with regard to tonight's central question? I submit firstly that few of the challenges that nationalists are dealing with today uh, or reigning, are, are reigning against are particularly novel. And secondly, that the nation state is a chimera because nations uh, and, and states are more often than not incom incompatible. The qualities that people claim for themselves or are ascribed to them by others, by <coughs> outsiders, also tend to be a lot more fluid than the institutions of the nation state itself. So there's a real mismatch here as well. And this brings me to the first reason for why I think that the nation state is not only a misconceived, but also an outdated concept. When we look at the evolution of state building in modern history, we find that the discourse of nationhood 
has had a very divisive, if not to say a corrosive effect on the way in which societies bond and interact with each other, and of, of course also our groups. Aspirations of nationhood have been one of the most common causes of conflict in the last uh, 200 years. And uh, I would like to quote here one study carried out by the University of Maryland, which found that of 339 ethnic groups that had studied major ethnic groups, uh, 146 began formed self-determination movements, and a quarter of those initiated violent conflict between the period of 1940 to 2005. And it was also interesting to note in this context that most of the civil wars in the 200 years, and I should emphasize civil wars in the most common form of warfare in this period, was also about secessionism, the attempt to create new nation states. So what these figures tell us is that while self-determination may seem like a legitimate objective in and of itself, um, the latter requires an other from whom independence is sought, and due to its high degree of abstraction, potentially anyone can lay claim to self-determination, be it ethnic groups, regions, cities, or even individuals. And some of you may be familiar with the case of the Principality of Zealand of the coast of Suffolk, which is one of the more fanciful uh, products of this development. Now, in that sense, self-determination is like a neutron in a nuclear fission that splits <coughs> atoms in ever smaller particles. This chain reaction um, has become all too apparent in recent years and the rather <coughs> negative consequences. As xenophobia and anti-immigration sentiments have intensified throughout Europe, so has the rhetoric of secessionist movements. And it pays to think here of, for example, the Catalan independence movement, or also the, the Lega Nord of Italy, or <coughs> perhaps more, more famously in the current context, Ukraine, which is currently you know, involved in its own civil war. In other words, all those calls to reclaim national sovereignty, um, which we are hearing in, from so many different corners of Europe, has simply led to, um, to a focus on what separates us rather than what unites us as Europeans and also as global citizens. Because many of the challenges in the global, in our world, are global. They can't be solved by nation states. Um, and this, I would say this valorization of difference is probably unfortunate because uh, not only does it negate the benefits that the, the transfer of sovereignty to supranational bodies would bring, but it also forces us to create a kind of reality that is not conducive to positive change. We have to remember the nation is, an, is a way, is a, is, a, is a paradigm that helps us interpret reality. And so when we force on the nation, we also choose to focus on difference. So this, uh, this leads me then to the next point, and that is the power of words. Words have power even when they are not accompanied by violence. Because I do admit, no nation, no community can live without totems or creeds that reinforce in group cohesion. However, <coughs> these elements become problematic when they foster collective identities in group unity at the expense of other communities. Nationalism has been responsible for some of the worst excesses as a result of such thinking and uh, James has already mentioned some of them. So, but of course we don't just have to look to the more distant past, like the Second World War, to see the negative effects. We can also see, of course, we see this uh, in our current current politics too. This focus on um, this choice, in some cases, of biological language to describe outsiders as, as foreign organisms within the, the healthy body of the nation. And, um, and so I just want to say also in this context that it is actually, we've seen a very, a very negative and very dangerous development, particularly in Eastern Europe, but also actually in, in Britain and in Western Europe, where radical parties have utilized, have appropriated legitimate symbols, legitimate ideas, and have used them for their purpose. For example, we see, uh, for example, particularly fostered by Islamophobia, the idea that we as Western societies need to protect our women, we need to protect our Christian heritage, 
all those ideas have been appropriated by <coughs> conservative, by national conservative parties, and have to have become mainstream to the extent that it has um, made other parties accept those ideas too. And so, what, um, what I will then finish on is, um, we need to think more about uh, <coughs> how we can transfer our mindset, how we can actually appropriate, <coughs> sorry, just need to change it quickly here. We need to think here about how we um, conceptualize the nation state as an entity that is not just inhabited by people born in the country, but is inhabited by people who come here, who kind of choose to live here, and for this reason are also part of the nation. How do we incorporate our foreigners into our society? And for this reason, the nation state doesn't provide the, the right context because foreigners often tend to live in cities. And cities are the future. We are becoming more urbanized. And urbanized societies tend to be more open. So, with those four thoughts, let me conclude and just say that the idea of the nation state that we've inherited from the Westphalian system does no longer work. And I hope that you agree with me. Thank you.